I'm glad you're here, Terrapin families. Really, really glad you're here. My name is Patty Perillo, and I have the joy and pleasure of serving as the Vice President for Student Affairs here at the University of Maryland. I started here in January of this year, three days before we as an institution started our planning for a COVID response. But this place is not new to me. I'm an alumna of the University of Maryland. I got my uh, doctorate here in public and community health focused on college student health behaviors many years ago. So it's wonderful to come back home and to be amongst other Terrapins and in the Terrapin family. I'm really glad that you joined us today. Very, very glad. I don't know about where you are right now, but I'm on campus, right on campus. And it is a beautiful, beautiful fall day here in College Park, Maryland. It's kind of the quintessential perfect fall day. The sun is shining, the trees are beginning to change. It is just a glorious day. And it is lovely, lovely, lovely to see many students out and about just walking in hammocks, throwing Frisbees. It's just a joy to be here. So it's also a joy to have you join us. And I'm really glad that you are here. This is how we'll spend our time just for this hour. I will uh, share a bit with you about the Division of Student Affairs and the work that we do with and for your students, our students. And I will also share a bit about the universities. We find that many, many parents have particular questions about that. But I invite you, as you have questions, as questions come up, I invite you to send your questions to Sarah Williamson. You can find that in the chat feature on Zoom. And Sarah will be capturing your questions and I'll make sure that I save at least half of our time to answer those questions because it's important for me to make sure that we answer the questions that you have because I trust that's part of the reason why you decided to come today so that you might be able to get some of your questions answered. And so again, feel free to chat your questions at any point in time into the chat feature specifically focusing on um, Sarah Williamson and sending them to Sarah Williamson and we will open up uh, our time today to respond to those questions. So now let me tell you a little bit about the Division of Student Affairs. And I'm actually gonna just share a couple of slides with you, not too many. Lots of people don't know that there's an entire Division of Student Affairs. And so one of the things that I want you to know as parents and family members of our students is that the Division of Student Affairs is comprised of 14 different departments. And here are the departments. Lots of times people just know these departments but think that they're isolated, but they are connected. They are connected as part of one division. So we often say we have about 3,200 students, faculty and staff that work in the Division of Student Affairs, 14 departments, but we are one division. And our division really is designed for one primary purpose, to serve and care for our students and our parents and families. That's why we're here and we never ever forget it. And what we do know is that your children, our students are the best of the best and the brightest of the brightest. We certainly know that about 30% of people in the United States go to college. About 7% in the world go to college and less than 1%, less than 1% get to come to a place like the University of Maryland, a preeminent research institution so we know that your, that your students, your children are the less than 1%. So we know that they are extraordinary and we wanna do everything we can to make sure that the best of them emerges as they develop and they become with us during their time here at the University of Maryland. So you see all the departments that work together to support and serve and care for our students. Here's another way to think about it. We actually break these up into different teams. And so we have one team that's looking at the well being, the health and wellness, the care for our students. That includes the counseling center, student conduct, the health center, and what we often refer to as rec well, or recreational facilities. And they're often thinking about how is it they work together to care for students, not just for independent, independent departments, but what are the ways in which they work together? So, for example, in the counseling center, when our counseling center is working with students who maybe experiencing anxiety or depression. What we know is that exercise is a really, really important medicine for anxiety and depression. And so the Counseling Center will work with RecWell 
to ensure that students are exercising as a way to care for them. And so that just gives you one sense of how that team works together. We also have an engagement team. And this is the team that's constantly thinking about what are the ways in which we engage our students and what are the ways in which we get, engage our parents and our families. They're thinking about all the programs and services and resources. And clearly now we're thinking about how we do all of that in this virtual world that we're living in right now. Because what we know is that connecting with our students and certainly connecting with you is really, really important for us. And we continue to think about ways in which we do that. And the other team that we have in student affairs is the living learning environments team. So the division of student affairs really is all over this campus and that's really by design. It's where the students live, where they learn, where they are, and they will run into or experience someone in the division of student affairs likely every day on their journey, even virtually every day on their journey, typically. And we're constantly thinking about how is it that we use our environments to make sure that we kind of step in, kind of intersect and connect with students to make sure that they're well and they're okay and they have the support that they need. We think a lot about how is it that we use our physical space on this campus to optimize students' learning because what we know is that learning does not just happen in the classroom. Learning happens wherever students are on this campus. And so we wanna make sure that we use our student affairs resources, our physical environment, to think about ways in which we optimize that learning. So that gives you a little bit of a sense of, of student affairs. And I wanna tell you about our, our mission and our values. And so given what I just shared, you can tell that we are deeply invested in student success, their health and their well-being. That's what we focus on. What we know is that the division is the team that really helps to create and shape students' experiences. What I've said before, and I'd like to say it again to parents and families, is that one of the things that I really do value about Maryland is that we do not just ask students, what do you want to do with your life? We don't just ask, what do you want to major in? We ask students to think about who they want to be in their life. What's the legacy that they want to leave? How do they want to make a difference? What about their character and integrity? And so we value outstanding service, that's service with and for our students. We don't see them as customers. We see them as learners. We see them as engaged members of this campus community who are truly learning and becoming young adults alongside us. We are deeply invested in their individual development. What we do know is that during the passage of 18 to 25, it's one of the most robust developmental passages in our lives. What we know is that our students are developing physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, intellectually, morally, and all the ways that young people develop. I think for a long time, college campuses only thought about students in terms of their intellectual development. You know, that they were just here for the classroom experience. And what we know is that is not true. That students' lives, their their, their development is completely shaped by the outside the classroom experience and we're invested in that. We think a lot about community life. We know that when students are embraced by and cared for and in the support of a community, they will thrive. I know that personally, I'm one of eight children myself and my father was the youngest of 15. So I grew up in community and I have a profound sense of how community can support the good development of young people. We are deeply invested in student health and well being. That's always been important for us, and particularly now as we live in the middle of a pandemic, one like we haven't seen for over 100 years as a country. And so we're thinking a lot about what are the resources and services uh, that we want to provide our students to continue to make sure that they are healthy and well. And just like the institution is, we are as well invested in issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We believe that all of our students matter. They all belong here. They all have a right to thrive and that we've got to make sure that this is an, a campus community that is welcoming for all. So this gives you a sense of the division of student affairs, which I think is really important for you to have an understanding of as we partner with you in care with and for our students your children. What I do know is that it is a family experience, whether it's your first who's come to campus, 
your middle, your last, your only. This is a family enterprise, college life as a family enterprise. And so we want to continue to work alongside you as well in all the ways that we can to support your students because we know the partnership between student affairs and parents and families makes a difference for our Terrapins and that matters so much. So let, let's talk a little bit about the work that we do in relationship to some signature events. Now this is just this is just a sample of, it's a smattering of some of the things that we do in the Division of Student Affairs, again, as a way to engage our students, and again, as a way to contribute to their healthy development and their learning. Every year we offer new student welcome. So when new students and transfers come to our campus, we wanna make sure that we welcome them and offer them a big Maryland welcome. This year we did it virtually, but there were many events that were offered uh, to signal to our students that we're glad you're here and we want to connect you to all the resources and supports that you need uh, to thrive here. Terps After Dark, and that's still going on. In fact, you could just Google right now, Terps After Dark Maryland, and you'll see a host of events as a way to get students in, engaged and connected. And again, they're still virtual. And we are offering some in-person physical events as things have lifted here in the Prince George's County and, and have lifted a bit in the state. We are offering some in-person events as well, but Terps After Dark is one of our signature programs where it's the first about six weeks into the semester where there are lots of opportunities for students to socially connect. Our student entertainment events, it's called C, C Programs. C is the organization that does concerts and movies and events. And again, they're rethinking how they're doing them right now, but they are, they're offering lots of opportunities for students to engage. We have RecWell that offers an outdoor adventure program. That's one thing that actually has been thriving right now because we want students to be outside and to get outside and to stay outside. It's just good for them in general, but it's certainly good for them in the middle of a pandemic. And so they have lots of hiking trips or biking trips or kayak trips planned for students, which is really important. The First Look Fair, it was held virtually. We have over 800 student organizations on this campus. And the First Look Fair is kind of a, a display of all of them. Typically, it would be held in the iconic center of our campus on McKeldin Mall, where we literally have 800 tables set up, where new students can walk around to learn about all the activities and events that they can get, get involved in. And the different student organization leaders are out there inviting students to participate. We did it virtually this year, but um, we certainly did it. And my hope is that your children, our students are finding ways to get connected in whatever ways that might take form. Clearly my department, my division's responsible for family weekend. And I'm glad that you are participating in our first ever virtual family weekend. It is my deep hope that this is our first and our last, because I would love to be in your presence and to be spending time with you and connecting. I trust that's the same with you as well. We host homecoming leadership celebration. There are many, many different student leaders in the Division of Student Affairs. We have over 500 student leaders that work in RecWell alone. So athletic trainers, swim instructors, outdoor adventure leaders, you, you name it. Um, there are students that are working in RecWell and all over campus. We have student leaders that are working in our STAMP student union who work with student organizations and are leading student organizations. We have resident advisors. So we have many, many student leaders on this campus and every year we want to invite them back as part of the Division of Student Affairs homecoming celebration to connect them. And it is our hope that your sons and daughters and children are those very students that we will invite back for homecoming leadership celebrations for years to come. And this is a campus that's deeply committed to veterans and the Division of Student Affairs is responsible for that care and support. And every year we have a really big, really special, quite wonderful veteran celebration. And so that just gives you a sense. And again, this is just a snapshot. There's a lot more that we do, but I wanna give you a sense of the Division of Student Affairs and who we are and what we do so that you know what's available to your students so that you have an understanding of, of what's possible for them to get involved and engaged in and you know that what's happening outside the classroom is a deep investment by this campus to make sure that your sons and daughters are, are doing well. 
So let's change gears a little bit and talk a bit about this moment in time and the campus's response to COVID. We have an email account here in the vice president's office. It's VPSA, Vice President for Student Affairs at umd.edu, where many people will be emailing questions, parents and family members questions about issues related to COVID and the campus response. What I want you to know is that every day President Pines meets with a group of us um, from the vice on his cabinet every day to look at a series of indicators just to see how we are doing as a campus. There's about 30 different indicators that we're monitoring and paying attention to because he and his senior leadership team care very much about the health and well being of our entire Terrapin community particularly those who are right here on our campus, right? We're very focused on that. And certainly in the city of College Park area and region. So every day he's meeting with the senior leadership team. I'm also meeting every day with the student affairs response team. And the student affairs response team is really the team who is providing the direct support and care for our students. And that likely makes sense to you when you think about the departments that are currently in the division of student affairs, right? And so it's the health center and it's the counseling center and it's dining services and it's um, resident life. And so all the places where students are. So it's my team that's leading the campus testing efforts. It's been a really important commitment and promise from President Pines and my team who I'm grateful with and for has been helped, helping to lead the way. So we, we said to students, before you come to campus or even close to campus, you must get tested. And then we said, as soon as you get here, you must get tested. And then we said, let's wait two or three weeks and test again, and you get tested again. So we've had these really big three-week testing events now twice on our campus, testing nearly 20,000 people each time in those three weeks. And now that we've started to get the results back, and we've many of those results back that you can find on our dashboard, we've decided that our testing plan moving forward is that we're going to test weekly now. And we will test weekly, paying attention to potential areas um, where there might be hot spots or people who may have been exposed. Now students and faculty and staff can always go to the health center and get tested if they're symptomatic or they've truly been exposed. But we'll save the Thursday testing day, and it's gonna be on a Thursday where we can test nearly 2000 people. We'll do that weekly in a regularized way. And if we have to change course, then we'll change course. But testing has been a really important process for us. Every time we get a positive test result from a student, faculty, or staff member, the health center team will call the student or faculty and staff member who's tested positive. And then we'll ask a series of questions. First, we'll check in to see how they're doing, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic. They'll find out whether or not there is, um, they have any health issues or health concerns, whether there's an immunocompromise, um, whether they've, got, they've been around others who are immunocompromised. They ask a series of questions. They also ask, as part of the early contact identification process, who they've been around, who they spent time with. They really want to know who is a true exposure, and that's really someone who has been spending more than 15 minutes with another person less than six feet apart and not masked. So the health center finds out who are true exposures. And for every positive person, there's always true exposures more often than not. And so the positive person will be required to go to isolation housing for 10 days. And the health center will call any student who has been in close contact and find out more from them about how they're doing, whether they're symptomatic or not symptomatic, if they're feeling well or not, what's going on with them. And they would be required to go to quarantine housing for two weeks. So again, any positive student, any student who's tested positive and anyone who's a close contact would require them to go to quarantine and isolation housing. And when they go to quarantine and isolation housing, we make sure they have a case manager. We, the case managers call them every day just to check in on them see how they're doing, if they need anything, how they're feeling, what's going on. There's also medical and health support. So the, the health center will call every student who tests positive in a regular way just to check in on them. 
And certainly if they're symptomatic or struggling, they check in on them even more regularly. We deliver food, our dining services delivers food to our students. We provide transportation as needed. Sometimes if students aren't feeling well, they need a way to get to our quarantine and isolation housing, so we will transport them. We also know that our students feel pretty isolated in quarantine and isolation housing, and we don't want that to happen. It's an unfortunate consequence of this virus where people have to isolate themselves. And in some ways, students are already feeling pretty isolated, and we don't like that at all. So we offer special mental health support. And so there's drop-in hours in the counseling center um, nearly every day during the week where a student can just kind of pop in and talk to somebody if they are feeling really alone and are isolated. So we're providing that additional support above and beyond the case managers. There's a heal line. And the heal line's for anybody that has any question or concerns or who tests positive or thinks they've had a true exposure. And so people can call the heal line and we get many, many calls during the day and someone in the health center will return every single phone call we get to check in. And we also are invested in family communication. And so for every, every time there's a student that goes to quarantine or isolation housing, the parent and family affairs team is available to respond to parents and family members who've got questions or concerns or who wanna learn more. We also have another team set up because what we had thought is that um, it would be really important for us to do that. So for example, if there was a student living on the third floor of La Plata Hall, let's just say, who tested positive, and you might have a, a son or daughter who lives on the seventh floor of La Plata Hall, you may have some questions about, so somebody's tested positive in the building that my child's living in, how will you support us? And so there's a team that's available to support for that as well. And so I just wanted to reassure you and to have you understand that there's a whole lot that we are doing at the University of Maryland to care for our community during these complicated, unprecedented times. Deep investment, a deep care, wanting to keep our Terrapins healthy and well. And I think that's part of the reason why we have been staying the course. We weren't sure where we would be at this moment in time. You, like us, likely witness many other universities going to 100% online, changing course pretty quickly. Some even started it three, three days into a semester. Some are sending students home. We are now five weeks into the semester and we're able to stay the course. And I, I attribute that maybe to kind of two broad things. One is the investment of this institution to care for our students and because our students have been doing beautifully, beautifully. I'm just so proud of them and so grateful for what they are doing. Maybe you have, like I have, witnessed many colleges and universities on the front page of newspapers or the Chronicle of Higher Education because they've had these really big parties. And the issue with the really big parties is that it allows for the virus to spread pretty rapidly. And when you get that many people test positive that quickly, invariably institutions can't support it. They run out of quarantine and isolation housing or they don't have enough health center staff to be responsive. And that's why institutions have had to change course. What we've witnessed at Maryland is that we are still getting positives every day. Every day we're getting positives. In a, in a campus the size of about 50,000 people, you would expect that but we're getting it at such a pace that's allowing us to manage it and being responsive to it. And so I applaud our students. I'm grateful for what they're doing. I walk around this campus every day and nearly 100% of the times, nearly 100% of the times I'm, I'm seeing them with masks on and remaining distant. Um, we have great partnerships with the Prince George's County leadership team, as well as the City of College Park leadership team. We're in this together. We're focusing on the expectations of the restaurants and the bars and College Park. And that's been really, really important for us as well. So wanted to give you a good sense of what we're doing here at the University of Maryland. So at this point in time, it's enough talking for me. What I'd like to do is to answer your questions. And so it's my hope that if you've had questions that you um, can just chat them to Sarah. Sarah Williamson, 
and Sarah has been capturing those questions and has agreed at this point in time to share those questions with me so that I can um, respond to them and answer them for you. So Sarah, uh, would you like to uh, let me know what questions um, we have? Certainly. Good afternoon, all. Um, our first couple of questions are in the realm of engagement um, for students. And so our first question, um, can you provide specifics about tutoring services or other academic services available on campus? Yes, you know, I just heard this yesterday. So I'm new to campus myself. I think I shared earlier. I've just been here eight months and I'm learning about all the resources available to students. Tutoring doesn't fall within the Division of Student Affairs. Most of the tutoring falls within academic affairs. But it's my understanding, and Aaron or Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they can go to the Maryland's website and just type in tutoring and a list of tutoring options are available to our students. If that's not the case, then I will make sure that we identify ways for you as parents and family. Look, look at that. Sarah's uh, posted that in the chat feature. So there's a link to tutoring options. And I just learned this this past week. There's a link to tutoring options. And my hope is that answers your question and provides that resource to you. Thank you. Good question and really, really important question. Sarah, was it about tutoring and something else? Other academic services on campus. So tutoring is a really big one. Um, I know that each of the colleges has staff available in their offices to answer phones, answer emails, greet students. And so if students have some academic questions or concerns, they can uh, go to any of the colleges where students are taking classes and get those supports. Um, I also know that if students have who are physically here on campus, that they have to do presentations for their classes, um, videos for their classes, that Academic Support Services has placed different video rooms on campus where students have an opportunity to kind of have their own video to do their work that way. And so I'm Aaron and Sarah, anything else that I might offer as we think about Academic Support Services or does that answer it? I think you've captured a lot of them. I know that our counseling center has a wealth of um, connections to other academic services as well on campus, whether that be guided study sessions or getting people in touch um, if they need any additional accommodations for their classes related to academics. So that's right. Um, definitely Good a great option there. And also the counseling center does have, if you go to their website, they've got a list of different workshop, workshops that help students um, as well. So that's another resource. So thank you for that, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Um, our next question around engagement is that some students are feeling isolated because of the different restrictions on campus. So what is available that students can engage in now that is in person and not virtual? Completely understood. Quite honestly, this is now that we, in many ways, I mean, I never want to say never or ever. Um, I have a colleague who works at Towson University and Towson had to change course pretty quickly related to the coronavirus. And she said this on a panel and it stayed with me. You're good until you're not when it comes to coronavirus, right? You're good until you're not. And so while we're doing well right now, I know that that can change course at any moment in time. So now that I feel like we're doing all that we can to do the best that we can to manage that, I also have been carrying with me this deep concern about our students who may be feeling isolated. And so what we do know about our students in this generation is that they are the loneliest generation that we've studied, which makes me sad. And I want to invest in making that different. And so does my team in the Division of Student Affairs. And much of that is because they feel connected because they're connected to social media and they're connected to their phones, but they're not connected to other human beings. And you all know that we are wired for human connection. And because they're more often than not connected to social media and their phones, they haven't necessarily developed the social skills to connect with others. And so we're spending a lot of time in the Division of Student Affairs thinking about what are the ways that we help strengthen and build the social skills for connection. So they're already coming to us feeling lonely. And then there's only one student per room on campus. You know, they have to go to isolation housing or quarantine housing if, 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 if they're not well or they've been exposed. So the, the sense of isolation and, and loneliness has just continued uh, to increase. And so we are constantly thinking about what are the ways that we help to support them. And so 
each week I'm sending messages out to students to tell them not, I think that there have been so many messages about what not to do that I wanted to send them messages about what they can do. And so for the first month, many of the messages were about get outside, find a friend and take a walk, grab a meal at the dining center and sit on Macauta Mall with your friends and stay six feet apart, go for a bike ride. And so we are now just at a place, given where we are in the county and given what's happening on campus, where we are opening up more in-person activities. And you're going to see many more of them beginning even next weekend and the weekends after. But even right now, there are things that students can do, like outdoor adventure activities. The Stamp Student Union is um, also hosting some movie viewing and some of that movie viewing is virtual, but then students can come together perhaps and have some conversations about that. There, there are a series of kind of meditation and yoga workshops that we're offering outside um, and people can do that in person. Recwell has an opportunity for students to rent different um, bats and balls and resources so that students can go out and play. And so what we're, there's also intramurals and we're doing intramurals and we've also opened up group classes, group exercise classes. What we know is that uh, we were seeing that many more men were going to rec well and much of that was because they were doing weightlifting, which is tends to be more of a singular activity and women tend to work out more together. And so the opening up the group classes was really, really important. My team is talking about opening up even more so um, next weekend and after maybe outdoor movies or outdoor roller skating. Um, some of those kinds of things that we are actively working on. For students living in the residence halls, our resident assistants have been asked to continue to try to build community in their residence halls by getting to know each of the residents on their floors and by inviting them to go outside together to do things together, whether it's take a walk together, whether it's have a meal together, um, whether it's study together, but to do it together. And so the RAs on the, in the residence halls are trying to do that as well. It's complicated, but we are invested in doing what we can to get them to come together in more ways together physically, not just virtually. And so you'll see more and more and more of that. I understand the concern and we're working on it. Great, thank you, Patty. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple questions kind of around testing and COVID response. And so will there be testing going forward for students who are not symptomatic or come into contact with someone who is COVID positive? So we will, every Thursday, test about 2000 people and anybody can sign up for that. We will have some high priorities, but not 2000. So for example, those in kind of hot spots where we see an increase in numbers, or perhaps for staff that are working pretty closely with the public. So those will be asked to get tested on those Thursday dates. But at any point in time, a student can go weekly to get tested. But if a student who is symptomatic or thinks that they've been a true exposure, they can go to the health center and the health center has the op op opportunity or the option to test people as well. They've been primarily testing symptomatic people as well as those who have had true exposures. They haven't been tested the, worried, the worrying well, if you will, those that are afraid that they were true exposures when they really weren't true exposures, um, but they will work with students um, and faculty and staff clearly, but they will work with students on those things. But we will still test every week about 2000 people. And if we watch, as we watch those numbers come in, if we feel like there's an increase in those numbers, we'll open up a big testing event as well. There are also pretty close to campus, in fact, students can walk testing areas within Prince George's County. There's one right behind the fire department, which is literally just a block away from where I am and I'm on campus. And so there are places off campus that if students feel like they, they, you know, they don't wanna to go to the health center or the health center is closed, or they don't want to wait till Thursday, there are places around campus where they can get tested. If there is a COVID positive case in a residence hall, um, do students in the residence hall know about it or is it only the residence hall students that the person was in contact with? Great question. 
So actually, they've all been good questions. Um, so let's just use an example. So I've used the third floor of the Plata, so I'll stay there, right? So we have one student who tests positive on the third floor of the Plata. Health center calls that student, finds out all kinds of information, wants to care for them, they go to isolation housing. They also find out who was in close contact with them, who had true exposures. Sometimes it's somebody on the floor and sometimes it's not. But anyone who is truly exposed will be required to go to quarantine housing for 14 days. And then we send a communication out to residents on that floor that essentially says, we call it our level two communication. We send it out to residents on that floor. And essentially it says, you're not a close contact, but somebody's tested positive within your larger sphere. And we just want you to know that. And we want you to just monitor and pay attention. So self-monitor, just pay attention to your symptoms, pay attention to how you're doing. And if you have questions or concerns, come to the health center. We do the same thing for the classroom. So if a student who's going physically to an in-class experience and somebody in the, and that student tests positive, again, that student would go to isolation. Anyone in close contact would go to quarantine. But students in that classroom who come to that class as well, students who are physically there would also get a letter. We do the same thing if we were to experience a significant number of student employees, for example, who worked at STAMP. Um, they would get a letter. We do it with fraternity and sorority life. If, if students are living in a house together and somebody tests positive, then people in that house would get that level two communication as well. So we're trying to do our due diligence. And then of course, if we find in a particular residence hall, like we did within Denton Hall about two weeks ago, where we were seeing a couple of positive cases on each of the floors, we essentially communicate it to the entire building. And so we will do that as the student affairs response team meets every day, we look at where there are clusters. We talk about in real time kind of game day decisions. Uh, what is our response? What do we need to communicate? Who needs to know? How do we care? Those kinds of things. And so, yes, we do communicate more broadly than just those who test positive and those who have to go into quarantine. Thank you, Patty, for those so far. Um, just want to let everyone know I'm capturing your questions. There are a lot of them, so um, please forgive me. We're going to hope to get through as many as possible. Um, our next questions are centered around Thanksgiving break. Um, when will a decision be made as regards to whether students will come back to campus after Thanksgiving or not? And can you discuss um, what services that students who do stay on campus will have access to over spring break? Over Thanksgiving break? Over Thanksgiving break, sorry. That's okay. So we are, um, we being the president and the senior leadership team um, have been talking about Thanksgiving for the last two weeks. And my guess is within the next week, clearly we will announce uh, uh, some decisions. At this point, we always make these decisions in consultation with our public health experts and our director of our health center, who is considered the medical director of our campus essentially. And she has said, clearly, we don't have data to guide us because we've never been through this before, which is just different, right? Usually any of us, even in uh, strange or different times, could find blueprints uh, to help guide us, but we don't have that for right now. She has said that given where we've been in terms of uh, the, able, the ability to kind of moderate and keep the campus healthy and well, is that she believes that we could continue to stay the course, but that could change at any moment in time, right? We know that that could change at any point in time where things shift for us. But for right now, we are thinking that we may be able to stay the course, but we won't make that announcement for the next for the next week. So I know that you are likely thinking about your uh, children coming home, um, your students coming home, and whether or not they'll go back. But I think at this point in time, uh, we likely will allow students to go home and come back. And if they come back, there will be some expectations and those expectations would likely be that they would be required to get tested um, that week when they come back. Um, we would want them to get, wait a couple of days and then get tested because of the incubation period, but they would be required to get tested if they leave, if they left and came back. And so again, we would make those decisions. Um, we'll make those decisions very soon. The dining 
the dining services has never been opened for Thanksgiving. And so dining services won't be open for Thanksgiving those four days that, that we are off for Thanksgiving. I guess it's the Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or maybe it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Dining services has never been opened even in non-COVID time, so it won't be open. But the ability for students to come and, and go could be still a possibility, again, with some expectation should they leave and come back. And you'll know soon, I promise. In fact, I'll make sure that I email the president again, just to remind him that, I don't have to remind him, he knows that parents and families are asking the question and, and we'll get a message out soon. Great, thank you. Um, staying on our dining hall area a little bit, um, when do the dining halls plan to open up for in-person dining? And also as weather gets cooler, what outside options will the university have available for students to still eat outside? So we haven't announced this, um, but we're going to just allow for this to happen organically starting on Monday, two days, in two days. Um, we're going to allow the dining halls to um, allow students to eat inside if they want. So they're still going to do everything in the grab and go containers. So if our students just want to grab and go, they can, or they can grab and sit. Now our dining halls are set up in a way where there's you know, limited seating, you have to sit six feet apart. The chairs are placed six feet apart. There are signs on the tables that remind students of those kinds of things. And we're just gonna see what students do. So dining services has, has a reservation system, um, but we're not gonna to move to the reservation system yet. We're going to see what's the comfort level for our students. We may find that most of our students just feel more comfortable grabbing and going. We may find that too many of them want to stay. And if too many of them want to stay, then we'll set up a reservation system. And so they are the options at this point in time for students to eat. As things get more cold, um, then we have been talking about, are there other places on campus where we're able to open up a space for students to eat their meals, um, but there's only limited seating. I mean, some of their dining halls are pretty big, so limited is relative. Some of the dining halls are, are relatively large, but are there other places that we might set up tables and chairs uh, to allow students to eat or not? And so we're, we're looking at those options, don't know what's possible at this point in time. It may be that in some of the cold months that, that those who are able to stay in the dining halls to eat. And of course, if we move to the reservation system, they'd be able to come to the dining halls and eat. And we'd be able to get all of our students in on our reservation systems, which would set it up in a way that you know only so many students come at a certain time. And so it may be that we move to the reservations formally when it's too, too cold, so that if students wanna eat in the dining halls, they have the option to do that. We may set up some other kind of makeshift space if that makes most sense. And of course, students can always just grab and go if that makes them more comfortable. Great, thank you, Patty. Um, our next question set is around the spring semester. So I know you kind of touched on Thanksgiving. Um, has there been any thought yet about how the spring semester will look as far as classes and on-campus housing? Um, so specifically, some students who decide to stay home for the fall semester because their classes were online. Um, will there be more in-person classes offers or if you know the mix of online versus in-person? Um, and then a side note is those who declined on-campus housing for the fall, will they have the opportunity to apply for the spring if they have in-person classes? So the first part was about in-person classes. And the, is the question, Sarah, about will we be offering more in-person classes? Is that? Yeah, I think the ratio or the mix of online and in-person. So right now the, the format is um, 80 about 80-20, so 80% online and 20% in-person. And we clearly will keep that for the rest of the semester. We are hoping to increase that a little bit the spring semester. Um, so I know the provost who's responsible for academic affairs is working with faculty to look at those options. Is there a way for us to in increase that? And so, so much of that will depend on the faculty members and the classroom experience and environment and you know, what they're comfortable with as well and what makes the most sense from an experiential learning perspective. So we hope to do that. But again, so much of it will, de will depend on what we know about COVID-19 at that moment in time. So there's a desire to increase that, but the realities of COVID-19 will dictate that. And of course, as we launch the spring semester, given some of the predictions, it may be that it's, at, at again, a, a kind of a heightened time 
of COVID-19 in the winter months and also, you know, of the flu season. And so there is a desire and people are working on it to offer more in-person classes, yes. We also are talking about, we have until October 15th to make the decision. We know that there are many students who still want to live with us on campus. Now we will never compromise the one person per room, but we have some available singles in different residence halls. And so we are talking about uh, the possibility of allowing more students to live with us in the spring semester. And again, we will begin to make those announcements over the next week or so. Typically, Resident Life makes those announcements October 15th. And so it's our hope to stay close to that timeline. And we're moving in that direction. We are moving in that direction, but part of what we have to wait for at the University of Maryland is what conversations are happening at the system level. So there's a, a, there's a University of Maryland system where the 14 schools, 12 to 14 schools in the University of Maryland system may make some decisions collectively. So we'll know those decisions over the next two weeks and clearly by October 15th will signal uh, one way or the other, but it's our hope that we're able to do that. Great. Um, kind of building off of that for our residence halls, will they keep the one person per residence hall room for the spring? Um, I think that you yeah, absolutely question. without question. It's just uh, public health guidance just really wouldn't allow us to, to move in a different direction. It just um, I think about that a lot even right now. And I'm really grateful that that we made that decision because had we not I'm not convinced we would have been in week five like we are right now. I think that we would have had to change course pretty swiftly um, because it's really hard in a shared space like that uh, to contain the virus. And so we will for the spring semester definitely remain in singles. And my hope is that we allow more students to live with us. Great, thank you. Um, our next set of questions are around kind of academic courses. Is it possible for some smaller classes to meet outside in person? Um, or are there other options for in-person activities for first year students that are on campus in those classes to meet up? So I will share that with our provost. That, uh, that, that, that was a question that came from this session this time with our parents and families. She's really responsible for kind of all of academic affairs and um, what what happens inside the classroom and I will make this recommendation to her uh, to her and um, my I know that she'll share it with faculty to encourage faculty to do so. I do know that some faculty members are taking some of their classes outside because as I walk campus, I see that there's classes outside sitting in circles. So some of them are doing that. I will make that recommendation. so thank you for that. Thank you. And then Patty, what is the number or percentage of students who are staying on campus versus those who stayed home and are taking all of their classes online? So we, um, we typically house about 8,900 students in kind of our, our, our campus proper, if you will, our, our on-campus residence halls that are part of the University of Maryland. We usually house about 8,900. This semester, we are housing 3,900. So to have one per room, it's about 3,900. So we have about 3,900 students living in our residence halls. Then there's also what we call the P3s, the public-private partnerships that we have a relationship with, but we're not responsible for. We certainly are responsible for our students and their care, but we're not responsible for the housing. It's a private housing um, company. And that's the South Campus Commons, as well as the courtyards. And they house about 2,800 students. So you've got 3,900 and then 2,800. So you're talking nearly 7,000. And then what we know is that in the city of College Park, we have about another 10 or 11,000 students. So there are about 18 to 20,000 students who are living either on campus proper in the P3s or in the city of College Park. We typically have about 28,000 students. So right now we have about 18,000 to 20,000 physically here, we typically see about 28,000. They're rough kind of ballpark estimates, but that gives you a sense. Um, I'm, not, I'm not able to, while I'm talking, do those percentages in my head right now, but I hope that gives you a sense of, of what we're looking at right now. But what I do know is that we have a, quite an extensive 
wait lists for students who want to live with us on campus, which signals to us that more students want to live here. Thank you, Patty. Uh -huh. um, how do we monitor students who visit campus that may not have gone through the testing events or what other, um, you know, compliance pieces are in place to monitor our students, faculty and staff? Sure, I actually have, and I didn't put it on that chart, um, but there's actually a, a COVID compliance team. And so for our residence halls, our on-campus residence halls, we would not let a student move into our residence halls unless they had indicated to us, attested to us that they got tested and they tested negative. We can't do that off campus only because most of our students put their permanent addresses where they where you live as their address. And so we don't know what students are living in the region or in the area. So we couldn't do a one-to-one -one relationship with our off-campus students, but we could do it with our on-campus students. But part of what's happening is that this COVID compliance team is taking um, every day, they're, they're taking a couple hundred students and looking at whether or not they've attested to getting tested or not, <coughs> excuse me, whether they've attested to getting tested or not. If they haven't, they will email that student that says, according to our records, you have not attested or had a, a, a COVID test yet. And invariably what our students will say, it's well, cause I'm still living in New Jersey or I live in Gaithersburg and I'm not coming to campus. So, you know, we'll let them go obviously. Um, but we will sometimes find a student who is living in the area who has it. And we will say it, it is a requirement for you to come on campus that you get tested and you need to do so. So there's this team that's doing clearly residential on campus. We have a one-to-one -one relationship and we know the students who are getting tested. Off campus, we're doing these kind of audits, these snapshots of compliance reviews to hold students accountable. And, you know, students talk to each other as they should, which is great. And they know that we're paying attention, which we hope inspires them to do what they need to do, which is really, really important. Great. Thanks, Patty. Mm -hmm. um, in response to our testing plan, wouldn't it be more prudent to have more mandatory mass testing events since many health experts say um, college age students are asymptomatic largely and would likely not know they are positive and volunteer to test? So we are probably one of the only campuses in the Maryland system. And, and you know, I spend some time with my peers, um, my counterparts in, uh, who are vice presidents for student affairs in the Big Ten. And I spent time with my counterparts um, here in the, in the Maryland system. We have meetings as vice presidents just to learn about best practice, what's working, what's not working. We're one of the very few institutions that have done these mass testing sites the first three weeks of class, then we waited two or three weeks in the second two weeks of class. So what we did is we got some um, kind of population numbers that we have a sense of what we're talking about in terms of positivity rates on our campus. And because our positivity rates are so low, we're moving in a different direction. And again, it's, it's guided by the director of the health center, where every week we're going to be doing testing. And we, we have a sense, we know, because students are required to self-report and they are required to self-report. So whether students live on campus or not, they get tested off campus, they're required to self-report. And every person who calls in or gets tested on our campus has someone from the health center who's calling them up and doing the early contact identification. And we're moving positives into isolation housing and those in close contacts into quarantine housing, right? So that's happening every day. It's happening right now. My team's doing that right now, making phone calls to people and, and moving them into quarantine and isolation housing, delivering food, case managers are assigned. That's happening like clockwork in the background. It's an enormous enterprise. And it's really quite beautiful to see how people are caring for our community. But because our positivity rates are as they are, we don't feel like we need to do this three weeks of testing all the time. We're gonna do every week, 2000. And if we see that there's an increase, then we're going to do more testing or require more testing. So that's why we've landed where we've landed. Okay, and our final question before we give you the last few minutes of closing, uh, does campus offer flu shots? Yes, um, we had a flu palooza. <laughs> that's what they call it. So they literally gave flu shots to hundreds of, of students, faculty and staff on one day. And then there was a whole week where people come to the health center. They actually had these tents set up on the side of the health center. And you could just go get it outside. I got mine. It was quite easy. 
They did all you need to do around, uh, you know, COVID compliance and making sure that people were safe and everything was clean and cared for. They are, um, the health center will be offering those again for students who missed the first round. I think beginning, I just got an email from the director yesterday afternoon. So I think beginning October 14th or 15th, somewhere around there. And so if you go to the health center website, that's where students will be able to sign up to get their flu shot um, from the health center. And we will be offering those in a regularized kind of way, because as you've heard, that it sounds like this flu season, flu A and B, um, will be pretty significant this year. And that combined with COVID is uh, just gonna create um, quite an experience for all of us. Although many now in public health are saying that given that so many of us are masked and washing our hands, uh, you know, and staying six feet apart, that perhaps we won't see the kind of increase in the flu as that they had predicted some months ago. So all great questions. Thank you very, very much. I hope that we answered them all. And if we didn't, you can always email VPSA, Vice President Student Affairs, at umd.edu. And Sarah and Aaron, who are on this call with me today, and or I, will respond to those questions. So know that while this was only one hour, we will avail ourselves to you whenever you want and need. We do know that you are our parents, you are important to us, you are family members, that our relationship is part of the formula for our student success. So we want to be in relationship with you and we want to support you. So please feel free to reach out. I'm so glad that you just allowed yourself to join for this hour as part of our virtual hopefully our one and only ever virtual family weekend. It's my hope that you and your family stay healthy and well. If you've got ideas and things that you feel like we need to do differently or better, we are open to that. We are all learning this uh, for the first time and we are certainly doing our best, but likely could be doing better and are open to any feedback that you wanna offer. But what I want you to know is that we remain beyond this one hour because we are all a part of the Terrapin family. So we don't just call our students Terrapins, we call our parents and family members Terrapins too. So you are a part of this uh, big caring community that wants to do all that we can to make sure that our students, our young people thrive because they are amazing. And we know that that's your aim too, and we wanna do it in partnership with you. So thanks for showing up. Thanks for asking your questions. Thanks for being here. Have a wonderful day. Stay healthy and stay well. Go Turks.